Hello and welcome to the STEM and Research Podcast. Today we have Aditya Radhakrishnan with us, who's here to share his story with science. Aditya is interested in computer science and is a rocketry and space enthusiast. He's even a third prize winner for the NASA Space Settlement Contest. He's a two-time Grand Award winner at the IRS National Fair and thereby a two-time ISF finalist. At ISF 2019, he won both a special award and a grand award. He is also a regional finalist for the Google Science Fair uh, 2019. Hi, Aditya. Thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Okay, so let's get started. Um, How did you first get involved with research? So, uh... I've been interested in science for a very long time. Uh, It started with an interest in space exploration and uh, then gradually transitioned to a hybrid of that and computer science. I guess that started when when my friend got the Lego Mindstorms kit. It's a Lego kit where you can make robots. And uh, he got that for Christmas and I found out about it and I got really excited and start to learn how to code and do things like that. And uh, what really interested me about robotics was making intelligent computers, making computers do smart things, essentially the field of artificial intelligence. And uh, so I transitioned from robotics to artificial intelligence, and that's kind of how I got involved in that sort of stuff in at the start of high school. And because of that, uh, I was just interested in these problems. and. Out of sheer luck, I guess, I found um, interesting problems in other fields that could easily be solved using artificial intelligence. And uh, in my attempts to solve these problems in other fields, I ended up doing a lot of research. Okay. So what are the fields you're most passionate about? What what do you currently think you're going to do with your future and your your life, I suppose? (laughs) So uh, one thing, though, I switch interests pretty often, but I think uh, probably for at least college, I'd uh, be focusing on computer science, but in particular, I'd be focusing on artificial intelligence because that's really the part of computer science that excites me the most, making smart computers that can do really exciting, intelligent things. Forgot one thing, uh, besides computer science, I also really like space. Uh, That was my first interest, and uh, I don't plan on pursuing that professionally, but it's certainly a hobby of mine. And I do like having both the fields interact and uh, interlap. I mean, overlap. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's really cool. Um, I think one of your major projects was Zolobot. So let's talk about it. Uh, Could you perhaps go ahead and tell us what exactly is it? So uh, that project started when I... uh, in a happenstance meeting, met Dr. Sanjay Moller. It was just him with a bunch of other school students, and he was talking about a bunch of different interesting things. So I live in Coimbatore, and uh, Coimbatore is surrounded on many sides by the Western Ghats. Uh, and because of that, you have a lot of naturalists living in Coimbatore who are doing very exciting work in the Western Ghats, and he was one of them. So uh, in his talk, he was uh, describing this problem he faced in conservation where there was no effective way to identify species, people like himself or forest officers found in the wild. So if they see, say, some animal in the wild, they need to know what animal that is. This is important for many reasons. It's important for preventing poaching, preventing trafficking, uh, analyzing diversity in the area, a bunch of different things. It's a really important fundamental thing you need to be able to do. And what he was saying was this was a massive problem because uh, the only approaches were either uh, perform a really expensive and time-consuming DNA test. So you'll have to take a tissue sample. Sometimes you need to injure the plant or animal. You need to ship it over to the lab, wait weeks or months, and then you finally get the DNA test result. And by that time, it's often useless. Um, but you get the idea. It's expensive and it takes time. This And the second option that uh, he pointed out was to hire an expert who can use, who can identify morphological features. Like they can look at that species and tell you this is so-and-so butterfly or whatever. Uh, but there aren't that many experts who are capable of analy- of um, uh, identifying the diversity of species in the Western Ghats, for example. So that's really not a practical solution. And this problem isn't unique to India. Uh, this problem is faced in many other biodiversity hotspots. 
I mean, hotspots. So uh, what immediately occurred to me was that artificial intelligence could be applied here, in particular, deep learning um, uh, to solve a computer vision problem. So essentially what I thought was you could use a deep neural network to identify images of species, which um, if you're familiar with deep learning, it sounds like a pretty straightforward problem. I mean, straightforward deep learning problem. And that's what I thought. So uh, I told him about it. He didn't really know what deep learning was. And so after that meeting, I went home, worked on it a bit and uh, created a simple demo application to show him that, hey, if you want to do this, this can be done really easily. And I used simple transfer learning and I created a network, created a simple front end app and I showed it to him. And he was really excited because this could help him a lot. Uh, but then he pointed out something really interesting to me. And uh, what happened was he opened up a catalog of butterfly species he was actively researching. And I pointed to one and asked him how many images of that species he had. And considering he was actively researching these particular species, I expected him to say like a hundred. He told me that only one image has been taken of that species in human history. And if you're familiar with uh, how uh, machine learning or deep learning works, you would immediately see that's a very big problem. Um, machines, machine learning techniques need a lot of data to learn from. And if you don't have that data, they don't, uh, they don't do what's called generalization. And if they don't generalize, they're not able to perform any useful identification. You need a lot of data. And uh, so after that, I kind of decided that it was impossible to solve. Um, uh, I met with a few uh, AI researchers in my area, and they were they had similar problems in uh, similar fields. I mean, sorry, different fields. Uh, these were industry uh, experts and uh, researchers. They pointed out a couple of solutions like Siamese networks or memory augmented neural networks. These are what you'd call one-shot learning techniques. So one shot means one sample. Um, uh, and the thing is none of these techniques work well because they couldn't generalize well. Generalization means you need to be able to broadly understand what a certain class is. For example, if you want to understand how to detect humans, you need to broadly understand the features that humans have. If you don't have enough data, you won't have enough information to decide what, what makes a human a human. And uh, because none of these approaches worked, I ended up thinking about it for a while, uh, even though I thought it was possible. And I remembered that the conservationist told me about uh, some of his friends who were able to perform this kind of identification. So they could look at that one endangered butterfly species and they could actually go out in the wild and identify other instances of that species. And I tried to think about how the biologist was, sorry, the expert conservationist was able to do that. And what I ended up concluding was that the conservationist had two things. He had um, uh, lots and lots of time uh, for biological evolution to aid in the development of the brain. So we have pre-built neural circuitry in our visual cortex. And they also have a personal experience. They're experts. They spent a lot of time with common species. And because they have both of these things, they can reapply that knowledge to endangered species. And so with that in mind, I came up with a system where you could learn from common species and reapply knowledge to endangered species. Typically, when you train neural networks, you train them from scratch for each new problem. Now you reapply knowledge and it ended up working fairly well. That's okay. extremely cool. <laughs> yeah, we we were going to cover about how do you manage the one data point, point but you already did that. So um, maybe we could talk a bit about have you delivered or deployed this project yet? That's what I'm currently working on. Uh, at the time of, so I submitted this for ISEF, but I suppose that's going to be brought up later. Um, I submitted this for ISEF. And uh, at that time, it was really just a research project where I did a simple experiment with dogs. And it worked pretty well with a 90% true positive, true negative average. Um, uh, but the problem was it couldn't be practically applied because it the way my system works is pretty inefficient when training. Uh, that's just an inherent limitation to my approach. But the nice thing is once you train it, you don't have to worry about it ever again. But the problem was, um, at the time of ISEF, when you have my model, 
you need to it could only focus on a narrow range of species like you could build one to identify any image of a dog you could build one to identify fish you could build one to identify butterflies but you weren't able to do all species and so that was the biggest hurdle to making this practically applicable right now i've been working on building a universal hyper network and i've had some fair amount of success uh right now i'm putting the finishing touches on it and uh I'm going to build an app and put it all together and hopefully by then it can finally be used in actual conservation. So can you tell us about this hyper network? Just a few brief words. So uh a hyper network is a neural network that generates the parameters of another neural network. So essentially what I thought was if you could so when we want to learn how to identify common species uh we need to encode that knowledge knowledge of how to detect a common species in some manner and what i ended up realizing was when we build neural networks to identify common species we're essentially encoding the knowledge of how to identify a common species in the parameters of that network so essentially the model we build to identify a common species has that knowledge and so my hyper network basically learns from a vast array of these um uh, all neural networks that already know how to detect species and it learns how to create uh, create those neural networks from just one sample. So there's a lot of details that go into it. Um there's a huge number of problems when you're approaching this because you have a network that's creating another network, you have huge parameter spaces, so you'll uh you have to deal with massive complex networks that overfit really easily you'll have to deal with uh small data sets uh um and so many other issues but um at a high level that's kind of how it works you essentially you train a huge network called a hyper network to learn how to generate another neural network using only one image of a common species sorry endangered species my bad yeah thanks so um you've also created a, a space weather prediction model right using deep learning again and uh, you you're calling it flarenet um can you can you describe what flarenet is sure so uh space weather um events are events that usually come from the sun uh that's the main focus so the sun is a huge ball of plasma and it has very complicated powerful magnetic fields inside it and because it's made of plasma it's plasma is charged particles and so charged particles follow magnetic field lines in the sun so what ends up so the sun isn't a stable ball its surface is very dynamic you have bits of plasma being thrown back and forth and sometimes what can happen is um a magnetic field can create a what's called a coronal loop and if this coronal loop splits and breaks away from the sun it can like fly through the solar system at really high speeds and uh sometimes this hits the earth but luckily the earth has its magnetic field and it can deflect these charged particles I'm sorry redirect these charged particles over to the poles that's how we get the aurora uh but it's usually not a problem for us uh for pretty much all of human history it wasn't but recently we've developed technology and electronics and electronics is electronics in general are very sensitive to uh just dist- electromagnetic disturbances um so we need so I'll give you maybe a couple examples of how uh important this problem is so uh there was this thing called the Carrington event I don't I don't really remember when it happened but back then we only had the telegraph and the Carrington event was massive uh so massive that it completely shut down the entire telegraph net most of the telegraph networks in the world if you if something like that happened now it would be disastrous it would cause trillions of dollars in damages it would um shut down electrical grids it would uh halt emergency services we won't be able to communicate because radio waves would be jammed uh the, the entire radio spectrum would be completely flooded so we won't be able to communicate via radio uh pretty much anything that runs on electricity could be affected in some form and uh if such a thing happened it would take decades to possibly decades to recover from uh you know people might think this could be a this would this is a kind of one off thing 
like an asteroid impact. Asteroid being able to find and deflect asteroids is also very important, but it's not exactly a highly probable event when you're talking about the time scale of a few decades. But space weather events, uh, a study from I think 10 years ago predicted that there's a 12% probability that we could get a Carrington class event uh, each year. So there's a 12% chance it could happen this year. Now there is newer research that shows that the sun is quieter than usual, but uh, it's not like this won't happen. Um, in 2012, for example, we missed one by I think 11 days. And the only reason we missed it was because the sun, the event happened on the other side of the sun. And it was, we missed it by 11 days because the sun also rotates. So even though the earth was on the other side because the sun would rotate, it would have hit us if it happened 11 days prior. So it would have been a complete disaster if it happened just 11 days before it actually happened. Um, and we were really lucky. So uh, we need to be able to predict these events. While big events are rare comparatively and the deadliest, smaller events happen all the time and they can be uh, important for uh, maintaining satellites or power grids. So what I tried to do was use deep learning to uh, predict space weather events. Now, uh, what I had to do was build two models, one I called Eagle and the other Ape. Uh, Eagle was designed to predict how the magnetic field changes over time. And APE was designed to predict the occurrence of a space weather event, depending on the current state of the magnetic field. Uh, the reason, the ration, the motivation for uh, using a deep neural network was that the patterns, um, the, the sun's pla uh, the, the patterns that the sun's plasma follows and the patterns that the magnetic fields follow are very complex. But I thought that there might be a higher level pattern, and lots of research has shown that you can make, you can come up with higher level patterns. So my goal was to train a machine to figure out these higher level patterns and predict space weather events in an intelligent and relatively efficient manner without having to create a extremely complex physical simulation. Okay, so. Like, uh, what neural network did you use? Can you describe the neural network you used for this uh, deep learning model? Sure. So uh, APE, which was the neural network that could predict a space weather event, depending on the current state of the sun's magnetic field, is just a pretty straightforward convolutional neural network. Uh, what it does is it uses an image of the sun's magnetic fields. It's called a magnetogram. So uh, if I remember this correctly, places where the sun's magnetic field goes out uh, where the field lines go out, the there's a white patch on the sun, and where field lines go in, there's a black patch on the sun. So you can kind of visualize the sun's magnetic field using this diagram. So uh, what I did was I trained this convolutional neural network, APE, to predict uh, what's called X-ray flux. Um, X-ray flux is how you measure the magnitude of a space weather event. And it predicts this X-ray flux using that magnetogram image, that image of the magnetic field of the sun. So that's APE, then there's Eagle. Now, the problem with APE is uh, it could only perform predictions 24 hours in advance. So if you wanted to go further, you'd need magnetograms that don't exist yet. So what I did, in, what I did to solve that problem was I created Eagle. What Eagle does is it takes the past history of magnetograms and generates a future magnetogram. Now, the reason why this was needed to generate an entire magnetogram was to improve explainability. So when you create these models, you also want to know how they're able to do what they do. Well, I can't say that this model has the greatest explain, I mean, a very good explainability. It does, it's a lot better than just having a black box model. So, uh, right, that's what Eagle does. It predicts future magnetograms using past magnetograms. And once you generate a future magnetogram, you can feed that into APE, and APE can perform its prediction. The way Eagle works is it uses what's called a convolutional LSTM network. So convolutional neural networks are networks, neural networks designed with uh, being able to handle primarily, it was invented to uh, deal with image computer vision problems. Now we know it can be applied in a few other domains, but it was invented to deal with computer vision problems. Uh, so on one hand, we can handle the spatial patterns in the magnetogram using convolutional neural networks. 
And on the other hand, you also have a time series. So you have a sequence of spatial features. And to deal with that, you have things like recurrent, you have recurrent neural networks. And one variant of a recurrent neural network is the LSTM network, called, uh, which stands for long short-term memory. And uh, basically what I used was a conv LSTM network, which is a combination of the two. Uh, so you can combine the spatial capabilities of convolutional neural networks and the temporal capabilities of recurrent neural networks. So you broke the problem down into essentially a conv LSTM making a prediction and your convolutional neural network using that prediction to come up with, I, I suppose, whether whether there is going to be a space weather event that could be potentially disastrous. Okay. That's that's pretty cool. And I mean, do you have any future plans for this project? Like, are you going to deploy this? Or are you going to release this in some form? So uh, it was mostly intended as an interesting research project. Uh, I don't really think it's um, ready to be used as an actual warning system yet. I'm just hoping that some parts of this were because I, at least to the best of my knowledge, some of the components I built are pretty unique. And I'm just hoping that some of these components might be useful for real space weather prediction uh, models. That's pretty cool. I hope it is. Yeah. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what has been, this is, yeah, this one really tangent, really quick, but what has been your coolest STEM experience up till now? So that is a pretty hard question, um, but I think I'll go with um, an event that was exciting and uh, thrilling, I guess. Uh, the thing is often in research, you don't have this, at least for me, I, I know that lots of other people do, but I've never had this one eureka moment that was super exciting. It kind of happens gradually. So one ex very exciting event that happened all of a sudden was, uh, I think at the start of middle school. So a friend of mine and I were uh, trying to build rockets. Uh, the thing is back then in where I live, they don't have, uh, they, they wouldn't, they didn't sell rocket motors unlike the United States, for example, where you could just go to a hobby shop and buy Estes motors. You couldn't do that where I lived. So we needed to make our own rocket motors and we couldn't buy fuel. So we had to make our own fuel. And uh, my friend's dad, another friend of mine, his dad owns a uh, cotton processing factory and there they use potassium nitrate. So I managed to get some 500 grams of potassium nitrate off of him. And uh, then I went to my other friend's house and he had some sugar and we, uh, it's called casting where you have to melt the fuel before you can pour it into the rocket engine. And uh, so we took a pot that he used um, uh, for science stuff, not for food. And we added in the potassium nitrate, we added in the sugar, and we kind of tried to do what's equivalent to caramelization um, uh, to kind of get the fuel to mix together really well and melt it so we could pour it. And we got the temperature like absolutely, I mean, perfectly correct. And then it suddenly caught on fire. There was a huge column of smoke. Uh, his, so um, his mom, came ru rushing in and uh, she was like really scared. She tried, um, uh, not sure what she tried doing. I think she tried covering up the pot so it would cut the oxygen supply. But then we tried to tell her that the oxygen is in the pot with the fuel. You can't stop it. You need to let it burn. And so the entire house was full of smoke. Uh, yeah, I was banned from making rockets after that. But yeah, that was very exciting. And what was interesting was we got the temperature exactly right, yet the fuel somehow caught up, I mean, ignited. Um, and we tried to figure out why, and we ended up finding out that my friend had used that pot to melt paraffin wax. And I did not know that he used it to melt paraffin wax. Now, I'm not sure if it was paraffin wax, but some wax. And uh, that wax had a lower combustion temperature than the potassium nitrate and sugar mixture. So because the heat was enough to set the wax on fire, it set the entire mixture on fire. And yeah, so it was a small technical error. And we, we only almost caused the house to burn to the ground. Well, you have a good memory, I suppose. Yeah. So um, like, do you want to talk about where you grew up and like where you stayed 
where all i suppose you stayed in your life sure so uh, i was born in tampa which uh, in a hospital that was really close to kennedy space center uh funnily enough it was on the day or tragically enough it was on the day that uh, the space shuttle columbia burnt up in the atmosphere which was sad but ah interesting i was born on the same day um or shortly after that not on the same day uh so one year after um i was born uh my family moved to atlanta georgia which is right above florida which is the state tampa is in and i lived there until 4th grade uh living in the us was it's a pretty different from living in india um school there was really interesting i went to a school district that uh one it was a public school but it won and it won a uh, a lot of national awards for being a really great school and i really enjoyed that school uh but then we moved to india which was also an interesting experience um uh so once i moved to india uh i've pretty much i only i've only lived in coimbatore in india so i've been living here ever since i moved in fourth grade okay you moved in fourth grade yeah and how, how would you say your experience here has been different like what are you doing differently here so one thing uh that is better for sure is the fact that i have a lot more free time uh kids school here tends to focus a lot on uh test prep for indian schools and i'm not really focused on that uh so i end up having a lot of free time on the side and that free time allows me to do a lot of other um uh, things outside of school which i might not have had if i stayed in the us and it also uh, my entire zoolabot project would not exist if i didn't live in india uh because then i wouldn't have met dr sandeep molar so many things would have been different so uh, yeah well well i definitely enjoyed school better in the us probably because i just went to a really great school district uh moving to india has presented me with interesting opportunities and experiences you yeah, but i suppose you found a better way to spend your time yeah um so now that we're talking about opportunities uh could you perhaps comment on participating in science fairs in india and maybe talk about how your experience has been with it so uh my so all about so remember how um after i met dr sanjay molu for the first time um uh, there was a small gap where i worked on the project before showing it to him the second time uh in that time period i participated in a school science fair and uh i lost pretty i mean i lost um did win anything uh lost to a project where this guy hooked up a fingerprint sensor to an arduino and made an attendance system So I'd hate to sound butthurt. I mean there are some projects that are that were really good, maybe even better than mine at that local science fair, but I it was kind of annoying how the judging worked. If they were not they weren't really comfortable with new ideas. It's just something they could if something was within their um uh daily experience like a fingerprint scanning system, they tended to be more uh receptive to that. So local science fairs I hate to say um I pretty much only had bad experiences with them uh but then Iris came along I did not know Iris existed for a long time um uh, I was not really I was never really interested in participating in contests I just like doing fun stuff and uh what ended up happening was my mom knew a person who lived on my street back in Atlanta Georgia and uh, he participated in icef so my mom remembered that existed and she decided to check it out one day and uh, she tried to look for the uh, indian feeder for for icef and she found iris and she was like hey why don't you participate in this and at first i was super reluctant and to be honest i was reluctant even up to the point i submitted it uh but i had the project ready and i just needed to write a few stuff so i went ahead and submitted it not really expecting anything out of it and then after that i got a call um uh with from iris uh and we had a so then i it was a skype call and it was at my school because i couldn't skip school that day i think i had a test and i was next to a classroom that was full of noisy students 
and they couldn't hear me. And when I was talking to them about my hyper network, for example, they, I don't think they heard me. I wasn't aware of that, but I found out after the fact, when they finally asked me, what have you done that's new in this project? I mean, people have used convolutional neural networks in the past. What have you done that's interesting? And I've explicit, and I had explicitly answered that question beforehand. I was like, oh crap, like uh, everything I said, I'm sure they didn't hear it because of the noisy classroom nearby and also bad, uh, a bad network connection. So at that point, I was pretty much expecting not to get selected. Uh, so it came as a bit of a surprise when I got the email that I was selected to be. I wasn't sure if it was an email or a Twitter post, but it was one of those two things. And uh, I found out I was selected, then went to IRIS, which is the national level fair for India that feeds to ISAF. And at IRIS, um, uh, a lot of interesting things happened. Uh, I was with two roommates. Um, one of them, it was very interesting. One of them, uh, one uh, got selected for ISAF that year. And the other one participated in IRIS this year in the 2019 IRIS. And he got selected for ISAF this year. So all three of the people in that room got selected for ISAF, which uh, I guess that was a bit of a spoiler alert. I mean, that's spoiler. Uh, Right. And then after that, uh, we had judging. I was also not expecting to win after judging. Uh, the first two judges were not the most receptive. And the last one went, I kind of gave up and uh, I was like, what the heck? And I just went with the last one. And that ended up going really well. Uh, after that, we had the special awards ceremony. And because we don't have special awards judges, I and I didn't win any special awards, I kind of expected not to win a grand award either. And then voila, another surprise, I won the grand award the next day. So then I remember walking up to stage and I was like, this is cool. And then I went down, I, okay, that, that's a bit of a, I mean, definitely an understatement, but I was excited and I went down and asked this other guy next to me, hey, does this mean we get selected for ISAF? And he's like nodding his head. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was really nice. Um, uh, right, and then after that ISAF came, uh, I wasn't really mentally prepared for ISAF. Um, so it was just like, I would typically for these kinds of contests, I'd be like, okay, we have ISAF in one week. And uh, um, I'd be mentally preparing myself for like the flight over to the um, uh, science fair. But this time, uh, I, I don't know, I just kind of, uh, it didn't really register in my brain. And then one fine day, I'm like, uh, my mom is like, do you want to pack your suitcase? So we get the suitcase packed and uh, I go over to the airport, fly to Delhi. We have a bit of a meeting in Delhi. And then after that, we fly over to the US for uh, ISAF. Uh, and ISAF was a very exciting week. Uh, special awards. Uh, so we have a, we have um, a bunch of different events uh, across the week. Um, I met a lot of interesting people, lots of interesting experiences. Um, uh, the people at iNaturalist, I think. So uh, I didn't mention this. For my Zoolabot project, I use a data set, um, uh, which is pretty much the biggest data set available if you want to apply deep learning to conservation. And those were they were the guys who created it. And so I met the guys who directly um, impacted my research at ISA. So that was very interesting. Then once again, during judging day, uh, I only got two special award judges. One was from USAID. To this day, I don't know why I got the award, but uh, the award, so USAID is the United States Agency for International Development. So they're focused on uh, helping developing countries. Now, conservation, while it's important indirectly to developing countries, it really has nothing to do with it. And so, uh, and their prize was for development. And so, uh, yeah, I was very surprised when I got an award for that. And after that, we had grand awards. Um, which also ended up going uh, fairly well. So yeah, that was this year's. And then after that, I wanted to participate in IRIS again because ISAF was so much fun that year. Uh, and I participated with my solar flare project, the Flarenet project. And once again, got selected for IRIS and then got selected for ISAF again somehow. Uh, but then unfortunately it was canceled because of COVID-19. But yeah, we had a lot of interesting things instead virtually yeah um, i mean that's how the three of us know each other and yeah. i'm pretty positive that it was a pretty fun experience 
So how did ISF impact your outlook on life? Uh, how did it affect the trajectory that you were on? So uh, I can't necessarily say um, it was a revelatory, very life-changing experience, at least per- personally and emotionally, but it has certainly opened a lot of doors. So once you win ISF, it kind of validates your work. You know that what you've done isn't, you haven't made some crazy mistake and it's just some kind of contrived nonsense. Uh, so that's really helpful. You know that your research is valid and it's not just in your head. Mistakes can happen too, but it makes it less likely. Uh, one thing for sure is that it's very helpful when I'm putting it for using my ISAF win for a bunch of different things. For example, uh, college applications for one, uh, having ISAF is a nice thing to have on the application. Uh, yeah, so, and besides the, uh, just writing, I won, I, I, I won an award at ISAF on a resume. At ISAF, you, uh, meet a lot of interesting people, of course, because these people are also, um, students just like yourself who are interested in the same things you're interested in. And so you can have some very interesting discussions and you can make a lot of really cool friends. You, besides friends, you can also meet professors. Uh, people who are experts in their fields and you can discuss your work with them. They can discuss some of their work with you. You can meet, you can find a lot of really cool opportunities. Uh, this didn't happen to me, but for some other people, uh, some companies were interested in their work and uh, the companies made some offers and it, it's, a, it's a very, it, it's a great opportunity. And uh, I'd recommend everybody, I mean, most people to it, People who are interested in STEM and uh, reasonably want to do it, I, I'd recommend that they do it because it's definitely a very worthwhile, ex- worthwhile experience. And uh, yeah, you learn a lot of new things, meet a lot of new people, and a lot of new doors will open. So I think as a person who has accomplished a significant amount, I think this question would be appropriate for you. A, a common assumption is that... Uh, you need to be some sort of an academic whiz to conduct research, especially when you're young. Um, what's your take on this? Do you think it's a misconception? Do you think it's true to a certain degree? So, uh, uh, I, so the nice thing is, um, in the 21st century, we have the internet and because we have the internet, we have unlimited ac- virtually unlimited access to information. And I don't think without the internet, I think without the internet, I wouldn't have been able to do any of what I did. So the internet is definitely super helpful these days. Lots of people are teaching themselves, which I think is the most important skill you can have, being able to teach yourself concepts and not having to depend on a teacher. Uh, but I have to say it is true to some degree. Uh, student researchers are kids and they can make mistakes. When doing science and research, there's a lot of rigor that has to go into it. And at least for formal research and formal academia, if you want to be sure that you got something right, you need to be extremely careful. And it tends to be, I can't say people who are self-taught um, and in my position are not able to do that kind of thing. I'm just suggesting that uh, you won't necessarily find the same kind of rigor and that can be somewhat problematic uh but it is by no means a requirement having to go through academia i I suppose um but yeah in terms of rigor and things like that uh i do think lots of student researchers miss out i've missed out many times i fooled myself thinking i've done something really cool when instead i've just made a mistake somewhere it's very easy when something happens and you want it to happen uh, you don't no, even if you try a little hard, you won't really be able to figure out that you just fooled yourself and you haven't really done anything relevant and you're going to accidentally publish, not publish, but share a false result that uh, is not intentionally misleading, but it can be misleading and problematic. Yeah, the first principle is you mustn't fool yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah fine. Man. So, Do you think there's any correlation between... Um, when I say academics, like since you've been doing this stuff in school, any correlation between your performance in school or, or any generic person's performance in school and the performance in uh, 
research time based research uh i don't think there at, at least i'm in cbse um i can't really comment on what it's like for other students outside cbse but at least within cbse i don't seem to find any kind of correlation between doing better at uh research outside of school and your school grades if anything it has a um negative trend in the sense that uh the more time you spend doing this the less time you have to focus on that and uh grades can slip every now and then it's happened to me uh but it is manageable you can at least i was able to deal with both somehow uh my school grades weren't absolutely appalling they were uh not uh, deadly to look at um but yeah if you're bad at i mean with traditional school courses if you don't get great grades on tests science tests or math tests it doesn't mean that you can't do stem so long as you're interested and curious and are willing to spend the time and effort to uh, get stuff done then uh, th- th- don't think that bad test scores are uh, mean that you you aren't going to be a good researcher or something like that yeah and i suppose you can you can find these these things are so intertwined that there there is a sort of a goldilocks zone between stuff that you do in school and and what you're doing by yourself to these kinds of projects so i mean i imagine you 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 learned a lot of calculus um before you were supposed to learn it in school um uh, through these projects that you you've been doing am i correct Yeah so uh, that does happen from time to time but what i found is uh, when you're trying to solve a problem you don't necessarily uh completely scope out a certain topic for example calculus uh i have usually been not too good at math um at least not sig- not noticeably good um and i did need some pr- some math that was more advanced than what my current grade offered a couple of years ago so when you're training i try to build a neural network from scratch and you need to know a, a fair amount of linear algebra and uh, you need to understand partial differential equations to deal with that uh, of course calculus hadn't even been taught by ninth grade so i did learn that but i can't necessarily say it's helped me a lot at school because at school you tend to have these structured problems that you have to solve like in under 5 minutes figure out the answer to this particular question and i also don't work very well when i'm told i have 5 minutes to solve a question so uh while there are overlaps for sure and sometimes it can be helpful i don't think people should um, this could just be for me but uh i don't think people should really count on it especially for things like school where you have very structured coursework and homework and projects and problems and tests and what not okay so there is some overlap but it's not a perfect correlation yeah and again this is just my experience but i if i had to go back to the past and tell myself what to do i'd say don't count on it treat these two things as separate and deal with them as such this might change in college though uh, it could just be my school is in a yeah, certain it, it way it does depend on on what on what the system of education yeah. you are enrolled in But I think a lot of people do have a similar experience where like you need to relearn everything in the two different contexts. Yeah. So okay, now that we're on the question of student researchers, have your abilities ever been questioned by anybody solely because of your age? Uh if so, then what was your response and how did you deal with it? So this has happened a few times. sometimes justified other times not um uh there was this one time i was talking to an uh astronomy professor i think and uh i apparently looked like a college student so i passed off as an undergrad and he thought i was an undergrad and i was just talking to him about his research and uh we didn't get too deep in the conversation so he started talking about his research for a bit uh and then asked me which year of college I was in or something like that and then suddenly and then I told him I was in high school at the time I was in ninth grade and I don't know how I passed off as a college student but uh it suddenly went from a really complicated 
up to a point where I couldn't really understand what he was talking about because my main focus was not astronomy. But he went from a super high level to a super low level where he was like explaining the most basic things ever. What I have found is that a lot of people are more helpful than you think. Sometimes professors just don't want to deal with school, school students, but a lot of professors at the same time do, and they're willing to spend a little bit of time with you to help you out. Uh, sometimes it happens the other way where they expect too much of me and I'm not able to deliver. Uh, let's see, there was this one other time I wanted to bring up. Uh, then there's uh, some contests uh, meant for college students in my locality. And I participate in these contests like hackathons. And uh, I know for a fact that one time uh, a judge explicitly did not select me for the final round because he did not think it was practically possible for a high school student to finish that amount of work in so little time. And so it does have negative impacts every now and then. Uh, yeah, I tend to avoid telling people what grade I'm in, um, especially in these contexts, because that only makes stuff worse most of the time. Uh, but yeah, if I'm trapped in a corner, I sometimes have to say I'm in high school. A lot of people are, uh, are very accommodative and they will um, they won't underestimate your abilities and they won't overestimate it either so it really depends on the context sometimes it can be bad sometimes it can be good uh, but yeah generally I say that it's better not to reveal that you're a high school student for most purposes sure but then if you're suppose uh, approaching a professor it's presumably you are going to mention that in that case how do you deal with it so uh, I haven't had too many experiences, but generally I'd say um, kind of demonstrate that you have some level of understanding. And then once it's clear that, you have, that you're not a complete noob and uh, you know a little bit about a topic, then the professors will, they won't mind if you're in high school and they won't drag the expectation down to rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice in approaching professors? So uh, for me, I so so when I meet before I meet professors, I like get really nervous uh, and I'm like super worried. So uh, oftentimes I just say, "What the heck?" If I you know, embarrass myself, they're just going to forget about it in two days because their life has far more exciting and eventful stuff going on. So just approach them, ask them about their research, things like that. Um, try to uh, try to make sure they don't hate you and uh, don't annoy them too much. But uh, yeah, try, try to talk to them. And uh, once they tell you about their research, you can tell them about yours and uh, then if the topic of your high school student, I mean, the topic of your status as a high school student is brought up, let it be brought up. So yeah, uh, don't worry too much about embarrassing yourself, I guess, because these professors do a lot of interesting stuff and they're probably just going to forget about it. Well, uh, don't take this advice if you're going to have to depend on this professor later on. It's just that if you're going to meet a professor out of the blue at some kind of conference, you, you can do that. But yeah, uh, don't do it if you're going to depend on this professor later on. So uh, what are your thoughts on fundamental research and what would you say to people who disparage the utility of research in subjects that aren't directly applicable to daily problems? So uh, the interesting thing was at IRIS, one person I met, he was right across our stall, um, my stall. Uh, and he was also on your uh, I guess lane or corridor. Uh, he was his was a math project, and he himself said the work I'm doing is completely useless. There is really no practical application. We're just doing it because it's fun. While that's certainly true, fundamental research can be justified entirely on the basis of it being exciting and fun and answering the most important questions ever asked. There's also a long-term practical benefit. So one of the things he was talking about. Um, was some of the mathematics that ended up being used for uh, uh, deep learning. And if you look at the applications of deep learning right now, it, it's 
huge. The economic um, implications of the use of artificial intelligence are massive. Uh, it's being used everywhere. Uh, of course, it's being used everywhere. Um, we all know that. Uh, but yeah, what happens very often is that researchers who are solely trying to figure out something interesting about the world end up discovering something that becomes very, very important to the few, the technology of the future. Uh, take, for example, uh, say all of science, um, uh, for example, uh, Johannes Kepler was one of the uh, um, important figures when science was being developed. And he was focusing on, plan uh, on planetary laws and sorry, planetary orbits and came up with this three planetary laws of motion. If you were some, if you were a cynic back then, you'd be like, "Why are you wasting your time, Kepler? You should be working on uh, helping us build better bridges or something like." I mean, bridges are important, but you should stop wasting your time on planetary motion. You should help us with bridges. If it wasn't for Kepler, we might not have had uh, Newton. Might not have been able to figure out all that he did. And if Newton didn't figure out all that he did, we wouldn't have Newton's laws of motion and. Well, we would, and there are lots of people who did work that Newton also did, but um, uh, we would kind of be stuck uh, when Newton's laws of motion are pivotal for the functioning of the modern world. Uh, one more example is quantum mechanics. A cynic back then would ask, of what use is um, the study of these little negatively charged particles around uh, these little blobs you call atoms? It's completely pointless. Stop working on that. Instead, help us build better steam engines. If if some if you look at the modern world, all of like, you wouldn't be able to build computers without the, uh, the knowledge of how um, quantum mechanics works. You wouldn't be able to build the tiny transistors that we have. You wouldn't be able to build the storage devices that we have. And if you went back in time and if you asked the researcher to justify the to justify his work with regards to practical applications, that researcher would be helpless because that person doesn't know what the practical applications will be. An example that I've heard somebody else say, um, a famous person say, but I don't really remember where it was from. Uh, Albert Einstein, I think in 1917, wrote a paper on uh, the stimulated emission of radiation. Now, if you look at the word laser, it stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. When Albert Einstein was studying that phenomena, or he did a lot of other things, but one of the smaller side projects was um, stimulated emission of radiation. Um, he, was, he didn't look at his research or the study of this particular thing and think, aha, barcode scanners. He was thinking that, um, uh, look at these electrons. They're doing something pretty interesting. I, I want to figure out how that works. And only like after 50 to 100 years did we actually figure out, okay, not 100 years, but um, 75, 80 years did we figure out that this has, a, this has massive practical applications. Lasers are used in a bunch of different important places. His special and general theories of relativity also seemed com would seem completely pointless to a cynic, but we wouldn't be able to build um, the global positioning system because we now know that the effects of relativity cause time to slow down in GPS satellites. And if we didn't take those effects into account, our GPS systems would be, GPS navigation would be uh, prone to huge error margins. So yeah. Uh, so there are like two main justifications to be made. One is that fundamental research is important on its own. It's you don't go up to a Van Gogh painting and ask, uh, "Of what use is this work of art Van Gogh has created? Of what use is a, a movie like uh, Mr. I mean, a TV series like Mr. Robot or whatever?" Nobody asks those questions, and yet it's somehow justified to ask a researcher questions of um, uh, why they're wasting money on answering fundamental questions that lie at the very core of what it means to be human. And even for people who are completely dry and not very interested in, uh, people are not dry. It's, it's a fundamental biological urge, but people who think that uh, all of this is just a waste of time and money, even to them, there's an important uh, justification to be made, which is that fundamental research does end up ha having practical applications all the time. The technology we have right now is the result of fundamental research that was done in the past. And so if we want technology to, prog uh, to progress, 
we're going to have to do fundamental research. So it's very worthwhile and we need to spend more money on it, in fact. Yeah. So I think it depends. The, the answer to the question that asked, I asked you depends on who I'm asking you to, because if you're asking some sort of government employee who's in charge of, uh, I don't know, uh, granting money to all of these research projects, um, they would probably be a bit more cynical than someone who's doing it because you don't do it thinking about what application your work is going to have. Um, I think it was G.H. Hardy who said that you do it because it's fun, especially mathematics, which is something so obscure from reality. You, you don't do it because you think someone else is going to benefit from it. You do it because you want to and you do it because you can. So, I mean, I think I'm fundamental sure research because... eventually, mm-hmm. I mean, eventually it does end up having a lot of practical applications after a long time. Um, but I think humans as a species don't have that kind of delayed gratification thinking all the time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I so to you in a previous conversation, how it works is basically we decide to do something because of like innate curiosity or like, yeah. And then we try and attach a reason as to why we're doing this. So, yeah, and I, I mean, I would say both of us are saying that you don't really need to justify why you're doing something. You just should be doing it. You just do it because you like to do it. Yeah. And uh, what I wanted to point out then was, I'm not 100% sure, but I think G.H. Hardy's work was very important to the development of cryptography later on. And if we didn't have cryptography in the modern world, that would be a complete disaster. So. Even he who said that it was, his work was probably, mm-hmm. I, I think he also said that his work is completely useless and it will never be used for any practical application. And voila, we have the, we have cryptography. We have one final question for you. Um, do you have any advice for young people who are just getting started with research and STEM in general? Again, I, as I said previously, I think the most important skill to have is being able to teach yourself. Right now, the internet is publicly available. Find something you're interested in and something you think is worthwhile and learn as much as you can about it and try to build upon that. Um, uh, uh, learn as much as you can and look for stuff you can work on and start working on them. I can't say that you should only do stuff because they're fun, because Practically, that doesn't often work out. But I think one of your main motivators for doing things is the fact that it's exciting. Do it because it's fun. Because uh, if you really want to look at it in the long term, you want to do stuff that are exciting and worthwhile. So uh, as much as you can, try to do stuff for fun. Don't do stuff monotically, monotonically or uh, um, robotically because you have to do it. Do it because you enjoy it deeply and it's exciting and it has important implications uh but yeah do it because it's fun and learn to teach yourself uh if you learn to teach yourself you won't be limited by anybody mentors or teachers and once you teach yourself you can go and reach out to try to reach out to professors and experts and kind of have them review their review your work and there's also with the whole talk about science fairs you also have a lot of opportunities to share your work and actually uh get practical results for the research that you've done. So there are science fairs and a huge number of opportunities for students like us, uh, students like us who are trying to do research for fun. So with that, we are at the end of this interview. Thank you, Aditya, for joining us today. Uh, Thank you for having me. (laughs) Thank you to the audience for tuning in. Uh, We'll see you in our future episodes.